Hello, everyone. We are pleased to welcome you today to Opportunities Beyond Borders, a City Age digital event brought to you in collaboration with the Canada Korea Business Association. Today, we will highlight the new era of plant based food and the opportunities this presents. I'm Zara Lani, a seasoned broadcaster and sustainability consultant, and I will be your anchor today. We have audience members joining us from across nine different countries. And I just want to thank you all for coming. It is my honor to be here today. Our show is being recorded and will be distributed to all attendees at a later date. I'm zooming in from Vancouver, Canada, and we would love to hear where you are from and for you to share your comments throughout the program. So what we need you to do is go to the chat section on the bottle, bottom of the panel. There you will see uh, the two section and choose everyone instead of the panelists. This way we can all see your comments and engage with you. Okay, so before we get to our first guest, we have a poll question. The box will pop up, take a look at the options and then choose your answer. We'll have poll questions throughout and we'll announce the results as we go along. So to start off today's episode about plant-based food opportunities beyond borders, we have with us Consul General Byung Won Chung. He joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1990 and has served in the Korean Embassy in Japan, the Republic of Fiji, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and the Republic of Indonesia, plus the Federal Republic of Germany. Mr. Chung was a Director General for Northeast Asian Affairs and a professor at the Korean National Diplomatic Academy before coming to Vancouver as Consul General in October 2018. Consul General, thank you for being here with us with your opening remarks. Hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good morning. Uh, it is my, my great Great pleasure to be here at this Opportunity Beyond Borders digital event. Uh, I'm very happy to see many companies and individuals joining us today as we aim to connect Korean and Canadian businesses to promote partnership in the plant-based food industry. As I'm sure that you, you are well aware, the rapidly worsening climate situation has shifted the global perspective surrounding the rate at which we consume animal products. Scientists around the world agree that intensive farming in the meat and dairy industry is accelerating global warming by producing excessive greenhouse gases. This is a pivotal time for agri-food industry and an exciting time where the shift to plant-based food in production has opened the door to new markets and sustainable production. Uh, this sector holds enormous promise and Korea and Canada are perfectly positioned to address to ever-growing demand for new plant-based product in, in the market. Our countries are already close business partners with strong trade relationship owing in great part to the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement 2014. As you know, Canada is global food superpower with the prairies being home to one of Canada's five innovation super clusters, the protein industry. Uh, this coupled with Korea's status as one of Asia's largest food and beverage markets could lead Korea and Canada to emerge as leaders of the plant-based food industry through joint ventures and strategic partnership. Korea and Canada are great friends who hold strong business ties, which is why I believe it is vital that we do not miss this opportunity to take advantage of our existing resources and form connections to advance the future of plant-based foods. It is essential that we act now to invest in the research and development of plant-based foods. Because we, because as the title of this seminar aptly denotes, the future of food is heading in a plant-based direction. Today, we are fortunate to have many representatives from prominent Korean and Canadian uh, plant-based food companies, as well as government officials, to explore topics relevant to the potential of the plant-based sector and illustrate the many ways Korea and Canada can work together. 
Finally, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to CKBA President Mr. Song Ban for hosting this event and to all the speakers and attendees gathered here to, tonight uh, to engage with such a timely topic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Consul General. Now we're going to hear additional welcoming remarks from Minister Councillor Tudor Hara, who is the head of the trade and investment team with the Canadian Embassy to South Korea. He has been a Canadian diplomat since the year 2000. And for the past four years, he has worked to promote trade and investment, most notably having reorganized and expanded the CAN Expert Program. Please welcome Minister Councillor Hara. Welcome to everyone. Bonjour. Annyeonghaseyo. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the com comments of uh, the Consul General, and uh, I'm going to echo a lot of what he said. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for being here. Special thank uh, for my part as well to Mr. Sang Wan, Sang Wan uh, the president of the CKBA. Um, from our perspective at the Embassy of Canada in Seoul, uh, we know that consumers in North America, Canada, Europe are increasingly embracing more sustainable and healthy diets, which include alternative proteins. And we are seeing uh, from our perspective that in Korea, it's no exception. Uh, it's important to note uh, for those that may not be as familiar with Korea, uh, consumers are uh, not only have a quite a significant uh, disposable income, but they are quite fascinated with new products. And the younger generation is no exception. And they are also looking to make socially meaningful choices, but also visually exciting life style defining products, uh, really something that can pop on social media. And this very much includes foods. Um, this is really driving the Korean food industry to introduce new products. And we do feel that plant-based meat in particular is really taking off in Korea right now. Major food uh, producers here, such as CJ, Pomone, Nongshim, as well as many food tech startups are increasingly driving this trend. And they are looking to grow not only in Korea, but at the global level. And we all know that South Korea is, a str is very strong in processing and manufacturing, but they do suffer from a systemic lack in ingredients. And, and this, I think, is the focus of the potential partnerships that both my team and the council were speaking of. We really see significant potential for Canadian companies for our expertise, whether it's centered around the protein supercluster or our broader plant protein industry. Uh, Canada is already the 10th largest supplier of food products to South Korea, and we are one of the preferred ingredient suppliers. In 2020, despite COVID, Canadian exports of agriculture and agri-food products were valued at uh, close to 700 million US dollars. And as the council mentioned, uh, the Canada Free Trade Agreement has really been a driver for this. Many agricultural products, including plant protein products, are already duty-free and more will become zero tariff in the following years. The Trade Commissioner Service team here at the Embassy of Canada in Seoul is here to help you tap into these opportunities. We're here to, we're here to help Canadian companies to export in the Korean market and give you a real reality check on your potential as well as uh, helping you set up partnerships and uh, B2B meetings. We are here to help Korean companies wishing to explore the Canadian market for investment purposes. And we're here for both sides uh, to help build the R&D partnerships. Now, just this week, as an example, my team organized a virtual B2B program for 25 Canadian companies and 30 Korean companies, uh, which resulted in over 100 B2B meetings. And we are looking at many business deals coming uh, from that. So we're here for all of you. Don't hesitate to call on us. Thank you very much. Merci. Gassamamnida. Thank you so much, Minister Councillor Hara. Uh, before we get to our first presentation, let's take a look at the results from our first poll question. There it is on your screen. 
And then we do have another poll question for you. Please let us know what you think is the most common reason to eat plant-based from the four options that are given to you in the poll question. We'll have the results for you later in the show, but first we are joined by our first speaker, Johan Turgesson. And I'd like to remind you if you have questions for Johan to actually write them in the Q&A section below. For your comments, continue to write them in the chat section to everyone, but for direct questions, put them in the Q&A section. Back to Johan now. He is a 20 year veteran of the plant-based food industry. He co-founded Burkhan Nutriscience Corporation over 20 years ago, and he just helped to establish a state-of-the-art plant protein production facility in Winnipeg. He has a lifelong passion for the environment and a deep knowledge of the plant-based economy. Plus, he collects vintage waffle irons. I would love to see this. Please welcome Johan Turgesson, CEO of Burkhan. Hi, Zara. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit uh, about the plant-based food industry, what's been driving it, what's driving the growth. Uh, and I also am going to take advantage of uh, a little bit of your time to talk about Burkhan Nutriscience, the company that uh, I'm the CEO of. So, oh, try and get this to go forward slide. There we go. Sorry about the delay. So, at the uh, at the core of this uh, movement towards plant-based eating, uh, there is a new category of consumers uh, that's being referred to as flexitarians. And really what this is, is it's, it's consumers who choose meatless meals regularly, but not exclusively. Uh, so uh, this is this is uh, number one thing I think that's uh, that's driving it. And and uh, really for a long time now, probably for over a decade, what has been driving a trend towards uh, plant-based eating is uh, basically health and wellness as a significant trend. But the biggest current driver, the one that's driving this uh, uh, new phenomenon, this food revolution, as I like to call it, in the last couple of years is this consumer awareness of the impact of their, the, their uh, decisions has grown and consumers are choosing plant-based to positively affect the planet, the environment, and the climate. So ultimately it's, uh, it's people's concerns about the climate. How, uh, how big is it? Well, uh, this is actually referencing a research report that came out earlier this year. It came from the Boston Consulting Group. And they project that by the year 2035, that alternative proteins could make up 11% of the total, this is the total global protein market. So we're talking about a multi-trillion multi dollar market. So that would put, that 11% would put plant-based alternatives to proteins at about a $290 billion market. So very, very significant, significant growth, 14% compound annual growth during that period of time. So let me, let me pose some questions. Question number one is, what are the consumer trends that are shaping the global food industry in general? And I can tell you from, again, from you know, many years experience of being in this industry, that the significant consumer trends that are shaping it right now are, does continue to be this health and wellness. There is certainly unequivocally a, a movement towards vegetarian and veganism. And by the way, we're, we're not talking about, you know, historically what was one or two or three or 4% of the market. You're actually seeing now in some demographics uh, 10, 12, 15% of certain demographics that are moving towards vegetarian veganism. We're seeing trends towards things like dairy-free, significant uh, towards animal welfare. Um, there's a shareholder of Burkons who I talk to quite frequently in the UK uh, who, who talks quite a bit about this. In the United Kingdom, there's uh, definitely a, a, a concern about this or a, a, a quite a focus. They have, a, a, for example, eggs you can buy, they're called cruelty-free, you'll hear. Uh, and then a significant consumer trend has always uh, been over the last number of years towards things like uh, knowing the origin of the products, natural, organic, fresh, raw. And another one recently driving growth in the food industry or consumer trend is to do with gut health and the microbiome. So in sum, what you really look at is that basically plant-based foods fit all those main consumer trends. So plant-based foods fit significantly into health and wellness, obviously into vegetarianism and veganism, certainly into natural and organic and animal welfare. They even fit into gut health. 
and absolutely unequivocally into the environment and sustainability. So then let's talk specifically. Why are, why are consumers choosing plant-based specifically when you ask people right at the point of purchase at the store? Here's an interesting one, is that as I alluded to earlier, and, and as the Consul General mentioned himself as well, the thing that's driving it more often than not right now is concern for the environment. This is data from, from, uh, from Food Navigator, and, and they're pointing out that even just in the two-year period from 2018 to 2020, there was a significant difference when they, when they polled consumers as the reasons why they were buying plant-based foods, and it's driving more and more to this concern for the environment. At the risk of, of overstating this point, I have a wonderful recent quote from the CEO of Nestle, the largest food and beverage company in the world, where he was making reference to the research that they've done, looking at their consumers and their customers, and saying that amongst younger co customers, this concern about the environment is off the charts, is the exact words he used, and absolutely a major influence on purchasing decisions. So now let's talk about who. Who are these consumers? Which consumers specifically are choosing plant-based foods? What the demographics show is that it's younger consumers for sure. To be clear though, let me, let me state that I've seen research and, I, and this research in fact right here backs it up that all consumers, all consumer groups, all demographics, if you talk about the silent generation or baby boomers or generation X or Y or Z or the millennials, there's uh, groups within all of those demographics that are adopting uh, plant-based. But this data shows that the, the highest amounts are in the youngest, surprisingly, and maybe surprisingly, uh, higher educated, maybe that's not surprising. Um, and what we're seeing is uh, 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 people of color and Asians in particular. So if you really look at the, at the demographics, the, the strongest or the over-indexing, as they say, is the 18 to 54 age bracket really strongly in the 24 to 34, income greater than 50,000, uh, college or graduate degree, and uh, people of color, and then also notably households with children. So the next question I pose is, well, is it all just hype? Or does the sales data support this, uh, this buzz? And I can tell you that absolutely the sales data supports it. In fact, um, what you see here, and again, this is uh, it, it, uh, uh, spins data that I got from the Good Food Institute, that basically in the past, in the two years up to the most recent data, which is the 2020 data, you saw that plant-based food sales basically outpaced uh, other food sales, the growth in, sorry, by two and a half times. I, I can tell you that if you were to uh, take the time and go listen to the quarterly conference calls when the big food and beverage companies out there in the world, the largest in the world, the, the Danones and the, and the Nestle's and the Unilever's, when you hear the CEOs of those companies talking, you'll hear them saying that literally all their growth, the really, really significant growth is all happening in, in, uh, in plant-based foods. The CEO of Nestle recently said that their, their plant-based options are now selling over a billion dollars a year and growing in double digits. So I've stuck in one more thing here where I say, is there more to plant-based food than veggie burgers? The reason I do this is to make a point. My point is simple as this, there is no question that the consumer awareness about plant-based foods has been absolutely driven by the newest entrance into these alternative meat, alternative meat products. I would argue that the TSN turning point, if I can use a sports analogy from here in Canada, uh, in terms of consumer awareness about plant-based foods was the wildly successful IPO of Beyond Meat. And there is also logically also a lot of awareness in Canada about Maple Leaf with their Light Life, but there's also Nestle with their Awesome Burger and Possible, et cetera. It has gotten to the point where everybody thinks that plant-based foods is only a reference to alternative meat products. That is absolutely not true. I can tell you that the alternative dairy category is also experiencing enormous growth. Uh, Vancouver, by the way, has a, a fabulous company, Daya, which I would say is the preeminent uh, non-dairy cheese company in North America. Um, and on top of that, I would go farther and say this, that not only are you seeing fabulous alt-dairy and everything from non-dairy ice cream to things like oat milk, you know, you see Oatly with their, again, successful IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. I would make the statement that virtually every single processed food product 
that has an animal-based protein in it, in other words, anything that has dairy protein or gelatin or, or egg in it is ripe for being reformulated and made into a plant-based product. So flexitarianism is really what has been leading uh, and, and, and now you've got this situation where it's really mainstream consumers uh, who are adopting this uh, plant-based eating. And importantly, therefore, food and beverage brands in response are looking for um, the uh, products that they can offer to their customers. You know, simply put, food and beverage companies are, are, are profit seeking. They see this huge opportunity and they're all looking for ways that they can uh, provide uh, products to the consumer that is that is essentially demanding them. So I love that. Burkhan loves that because that's created an opportunity for new and innovative plant-based protein ingredients or plant-based ingredients, period, and enter Burkhan. And this is what we've done. This is what I've been working on for the last 21 years. Uh, Burkhan Nutriscience, we're a Canadian company, originally uh, basically Winnipeg with a head office in Vancouver. We develop, uh, in fact, we are the leading company in the world in the development of technologies to produce plant-based proteins from agricultural starting materials. We like to say that uh, a better process leads to better proteins and a better planet. So what do I mean when I say better process? Burkhan is, as I said, it's a technology company. We have focused doing research and development over the last more than 20 years uh, at our technical center in Winnipeg on developing up our patented repeatable processes to produce proteins from things like canola, field peas, uh, soybeans, uh, you name it. We have technologies for flax, hemp, et cetera, have developed up a significant intellectual property portfolio. Uh, to date, uh, nearly 300 granted patents. We have over 200 patents in the pipeline, uh, really a significant patenting and IP machine. What do I mean when I say we develop better proteins? Simply put, we strive to produce proteins that uh, work better in the food and beverage products that they're designed for. So what that means is proteins that have better flavor characteristics, proteins that function better. Protein ingredients, by the way, are more often than not incorporated into food and beverage products because of the way they function, because of the way that they can act as an emulsifier or whipping, foaming, binding, film forming agent. And ultimately what makes a protein better is to have better taste, better nutrition and better function. And all of what we do ultimately also works in terms of being better for the planet. Not only do we ourselves fit squarely into the halo of the fact that uh, as the Consul General at the beginning pointed out, um, you know, when you move to plant-based eating and you move more and more away from animal husbandry and animal agriculture, you move away and uh, from significant greenhouse gas emissions that come from uh, uh, the animal agriculture. Not only is that uh, in and of itself uh, uh, climate friendly and, 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 and more sustainable, but Burkhan strives to uh, develop our technologies so that we minimize water use in the newest facility that we've built in a joint venture at Merit Functional Foods. There is significant water recycle built in, all of which is aimed at, at, at the environment. Um, you know, if you talk about, uh, about Burkhan and if you talk about Merit, you talk about this opportunity, you can't uh, also talk about the fact that we operate in the ideal environment uh, being Canada. Uh, we have benefited from organizations like Protein Industries Canada, uh, the CAP program, from Export Development Canada, from Farm Credit Canada, from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, all of which are fabulous supporters. Thank you very much, Bill Gruel, who is on the line here. Uh, uh, Merit has been fabulously supported by Protein Industries Canada with, uh, with some significant funding that, that uh, unequivocally is helping us to bring our technologies to the world and to add value to Canadian agriculture. With that, let me talk just really quickly about Merit. Merit is a joint venture that we uh, founded with three individuals, Ryan Brackenberry, Tomiski, and Sean Crew in Winnipeg. Has, Merit has built an absolutely beautiful state-of-the-art uh, protein production facility in Winnipeg that has a very, very unique characteristic, which is that it can produce proteins, plant-based proteins, both from Canadian yellow field peas, as well as from uh, Canadian canola. It is in fact the world's first and only commercial scale production facility capable of producing food grade canola protein. 
an absolutely gorgeous facility um, and uh, one that is targeted also, by the way, to be uh, carbon neutral by 2022. Let me talk just really quickly, give you guys some sense of, of what you can do with Merit's uh, proteins. One of the things we're really excited about is one of the proteins that is uh, being produced by Merit, uh, Puritine. Uh, it's actually technically, it's specifically called Puritine G because of the reference to the ability of that protein to gel. And it has a fabulous application into uh, alternative meats because it can actually work to replace methyl cellulose. An ingredient that you would see, by the way, if you go to the store and pick up something like Beyond Meats Burgers or Impossible Foods, et cetera, or Nestle's, uh, methyl cellulose is incorporated into those products because it gels and holds the product together. But trust me, none of the food companies want to have an ingredient on their label that sounds as chemically as methyl cellulose. And I don't think any consumer ever said after eating something that tasted good, but I wish it had more methyl cellulose. Anyways, this is just me describing one example of something that you can do with uh, these plant-based proteins that Merit is able to produce um, from canola. At the absolute far extreme, there's another protein in canola that uh, has other completely different uh, functional characteristics and has the ability to replace, as an example, the gelatin that would be in marshmallows or uh, more exciting than that would be all sorts of applications into uh, dairy applications like uh, ice creams and yogurts, et cetera. Similarly, the pea protein that Merit produces has really fabulous application into dairy alternatives, whether that's ice cream, whether that's uh, dairy alternative beverages, uh, again, uh, non-dairy yogurts. One of the really exciting ones is in, is in uh, plant-based cheese. Um, I would strongly encourage you if you're interested in Burkhan and or Merit, take some time, go on Merit's website, take a look at their LinkedIn uh, pres um, uh, presence, and you'll see all kinds of excellent information about what it is that we can do uh, with the proteins in terms of food products. So lastly, let me, let me just talk a tiny little bit about Burkhan. Um, Burkhan has been operating now for over 20 years in Winnipeg. We have an extraordinary team of scientists and engineers. That is the team that's really responsible for the huge intellectual property portfolio we've generated. You know, I, 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 I stress this point because it's, it's I think worth noting, Everybody's excited about plant-based food right now. They weren't so much 21 years ago when we started out. It's actually funny to think back. We literally would walk into meetings back there, back then and have to explain to people what protein was. Um, but the world has come a long way. We have consumers now that are very, very aware of what it is that is in their food and beverage products. We have consumers that are not only concerned about their health and wellness, but they're concerned about how their buying decisions impact the planet. Uh, the innovation pipeline at Burkhan is significant. We're working not only on continuing to do improvements to the canola and peas that is already under license to merit, but under many other potential products, uh, everything from faba bean to uh, hemp or sunflower. So let me summarize by saying this, and I'm basically gonna repeat what I said before, but uh, I learned uh, once back in business school from Xerox, uh, basically say it twice in a presentation if you wanna get the point across, so the point is simply this, the plant-based food revolution is real and it's really developing. And the simple point is that consumers want plant-based alternatives because they not only wanna feel better about what nourishes them, but they wanna feel better about their impact on the planet. As a result, CPG companies are searching for better plant-based proteins and plant-based ingredients to formulate new foods and beverages to meet that consumer demand. For over 20 years, Burkhan has invested over $100 million into R&D and has built an incredible amount of know-how in plant-based protein ingredients. So the takeaway is as simple as this, plant-based plant -based eating is booming. It is a true food revolution. Canada is an agricultural powerhouse and can take a leading role in the development of plant-based protein and plant-based foods. Burkhan is a leader within that development has truly differentiated proteins that are on point for what the market is looking for. Thank you very much. Sorry, you're muted. Thank you so much, Johan. And thank you for laying that out for us and showing us the sales data for the growth in plant-based food sales growth and the innovative work that you're doing. And all of you who are watching from home, you are watching Opportunities Beyond Borders, a City Age digital event brought to you in collaboration with the Canada Korea Business Association. Thank you all for joining us today. Now we have the results from our second poll question. It'll pop up on your screen. And we see that more than half of you chose health and nutrition. 
We do have a third question for you. It's about barriers to getting plant-based food and beverages. That poll question pops up right now. You have your options. Please make your choice and we will be revealing results as we go through the show. Now, our next guest is the Global Sales Director for Jiquin Company. Ms. Seyoung Park has worked with several global companies, including Domino's Pizza, Subway, 7-Eleven, and that's just a few of who she's worked with. She's helped these global companies to launch and promote plant-based menu options. She loves to learn about new cultures, and if she didn't have her current career, she'd be a painter. Please welcome Ms. Seyoung Park. Um, hello, my name is Seyoung Park, and I'm a sales global sales director of Jiguin Company, and I'm here on behalf of Kim Min, the CEO of Jiguin Company. So um, we are the manufacturer and the distributor, um, or the manufacturer and the distributor of the plant-based food brand Unlimit, based in Seoul, Korea. And I'm really glad to have this chance to meet you all. And thank you for having me today as a speaker. And I'll briefly introduce our company and the brand and talk about how we expanded globally, especially in Asia, and also talk about our goals and challenges in penetrating the North American markets, um, especially Canada. So um, we started out as an ugly fruit savers. So we bought scratchy and ugly fruits and vegetables from the farmers and made products with longer, longer shelf life, such as gems, spreads, porridges, etc. And by doing so, we could compensate the farmers with what they really deserve and save these amazing, delicious vegetables at the same time. Um, while running the businesses, um, we've also found out that there are so much unused grain stocks due to an overproducing of Korea and people's not preferring ugly grains. So we thought maybe um, we can make something out of it. And that's how we research it and develop the plant-based meat. Um, we have our um, in-house R&D and manufacturing factory in Korea. Um, which um, no animal ingredients are allowed. This is very unique feature in Asia because most of the plant-based brands in Asia are trying to scale up. So they mostly utilize the, <clears throat> the OEM strategy, not um, build their own factory or in-house R&D team. So now we're building um, our second factory, which is a um, 1500 square feet factory in Korea for the aggressive expansion next year. And we'll also be um, halal, halal certification ready, um, which opens up more country options for us for next year. Um, our brand Unlimit, um, the compound word of unlimited and meat means the meat for everyone. So these are the signature products. Um, when you think of a plant-based meat, the patties come first because that's what the big guys in the industry are coming up with. But um, that's not what Asian people consume on a daily basis. And we found out the most versatile type of meat is slices. It goes well with any cuisine, not only Asian meals, but also with any kind of um, Western style dishes. For example, you can make bulgogi out of it really easily. And mm, you can also make a Philly cheese steak sandwich at the same time. So this is how um, Unlimited Barbecue Slices became our signature product. And we have um, smoky pulled pork too. You can see the pulling texture here. Um, it really conveys slow cooked barbecues, chewy texture. And we recently um, launched um, ready to eat products such as vegan bulgogi fried rice, veggie pizza dumplings and um, frozen bulgogi meal kits so that um, uh, you can just throw them in the microwave and eat instantly. So we just launched the vegan cheddar slices too. In the future, um, we are um, launching a vegan beef jerky and veggie dumplings and vegan mozzarella cheese and we're really expanding the product range. We cannot um, wait to show our products and test the market um, of Canada with these products. And um, as a global sales director, um, I thought our first overseas market had to be Hong Kong. Um, at that time, it had the highest plant-based demographic among Asia. 
So now Unlimited is sold in hundreds of 7-Eleven stores as a vegan sandwich. And we're in sushi franchises, Michelin restaurants, um, and so on. Um, we're doing really great in Hong Kong and we naturally expanded to China by collaborating with famous Chinese family restaurant franchise called Tang Palace. Um, it has um, over 60 stores um, throughout China. And we also just launched it in Vietnam and Australia and we're pre preparing to enter Taiwan and Middle East too. And we just came back from Anuga exhibition um, from Germany. So we hopefully create um, a bridge in Europe too and test our products in um, 2022. Our key strategy to these Asia markets um, was to find the right partner for each country. So it can take a while or it can also proceed really quickly depending on your trust and chemistry um, and reliability. And in some countries, we work with a huge FNB giant. And in other countries, for example, um, in Taiwan, we work with one of the biggest food distributor, um, Tate, and um, we work with medium-sized distributor in some countries who's really passionate and efficient. Um, for example, we have partnership with Fruitsco, um, they're originally um, a fruit vendor um, in Vietnam, but they do have all the connections nationwide. So it really depends um, on the market, what kind of partnership you want to have and um, what is most efficient. Um, Korea's plant-based industry is still, I would say, um, is in really an early stage. Um, the vegan and plant-based keyword itself is a very huge thing in Korea now, including um, cosmetics, food, and fashion sectors, and almost every sector now. Um, however, whether it's trending or um, looking hip is a totally different thing with um, whether the sector can scale up in terms of monetizing. So in relatively conservative cultures um, like Asia, um, you want to approach the public seamlessly rather than just um, put your products on the shelves of the retail channel. So we try to collaborate with collaborate with big named brands such as um, Domino's Pizza. Um, now in Domino's Pizza in Korea, um, we have five different um, plant-based meat pizzas and we have a separate um, plant-based pizza section because of Unlimit. And in Subway, Korea, we have um, Korean barbecue um, slice sandwich. Um, and all other, um, and you can tell people that uh, you can try it. It's one of saving earth and it tastes actually good too. So that's what we wanted to um, tell people. So once people who are interested in the environment or the plant-based culture, um, try this kind of um, tasty and familiar sandwich that um, they've always knew and liked it, and they can be our um, next retail targets. So we're taking a gradual approach um, from the brand, name branded um, franchises to the B2C retail sector. So these are all the um, big brands um, in Korea. Um, this is Paris Baguette, which is one of the biggest um, bakery franchises in Korea. They have 4,400 um, stores nationwide. So we're launching an unlimited <clears throat> wrap sandwich um, nationwide, and we will um, expand our product range next year. And um, we've been also trying really hard to penetrate the North American markets. However, um, it's been very challenging for us. Um, one thing is um, our lack of information um, to these markets. So due to COVID now, 
um, it was nearly impossible to build a reliable team, reliable team there. And everything got so unreliable, the logistics, shippings, OEMs, R&D and everything. For example, if we want to launch a vegan meat pie or the vegan dumplings in Canada, um, where do we start? Do we contact the um, retail channels of Canada or do we find a meat pie um, manufacturer? Um, should we even produce in Canada? Or will there be a market and will, we, will it worth it? So um, what kind of aroma and texture Canadian people prefer? So it's just impossible to start. And the factory that we're building in Korea now, um, it could have been in Canada if we had a better chance to explore the industry and market and um, with the right partner. So our main goals for the next couple of years um, in Canada are to launch our products in the major franchises and the major retail channels and do the market tests so that um, we can develop the right product for the market. So we want to know the market and we want to develop the products that just fit to the culture and people. For example, I know that um, Tim Hortons launched a sandwich with Beyond Meat um, Patty last year. Um, just like that, uh, we can launch a K barbecue bulgogi sandwich in Subway Canada just like we did in um, Subway Korea. So what we're looking for um, is the distribution and the marketing partner who's expert in the F&B industry of Canada. And by connecting with them, I believe um, we can bring the fancy plant-based cave food loved by Canadian people. So um, um, I'm afraid my time's up. So I really hope to continue this conversation afterwards. So please let me know if you have any questions. Um, you can email me and thank you for listening and thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sayoung. I'm looking forward to your Canadian launch. Now, as we move through the program, we have the results from our last poll question. It'll pop up on your screen right there. We can see, uh, it was pretty spread out what you just thought was the biggest barrier to getting plant-based food and beverages more widely available. I want to thank you again for joining us today. I'm Zara Lani and you're watching Foods Future Opportunities Beyond Borders. Now please help me to welcome our next guest and the host of our panel discussion, Bill Gruel. Bill is the CEO of Protein Industries Canada. He was born and raised on a mixed farm near Bruno, Saskatchewan and has been involved and employed in agriculture for as long as he can remember. He started his career at Zeneca Seeds where he helped, helped to bring the world's first canola hybrids to market. Bill is going to give us an overview of the next topic in our show before we introduce the rest of the panel. So Bill, I'll take it away. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you, Zara. And um, you know, Johan, it was great to hear the progress that you've made over time. Just uh, for those listening, uh, Johan was one of the first uh, people I visited at Burkhan when I became the CEO of Protein Industries Canada, and it's just great to see the progress that they've made. Really a great example of what we're trying to do at Protein Industries Canada. For those of you who don't know, we are an innovation super cluster. We're investing to grow Canada's plant-based uh, food and ingredient sector. Uh, we're managing a lot, about 30 large-scale science and innovation projects that total almost $430 million of investments in areas like plant breeding, uh, adjusting our crops for protein content, protein functionality, uh, amino acid balance and nutrition, uh, the development of new and novel ingredient processing technologies, and the creation and development of new plant-based foods. It's a very exciting space for Canada, as I think some of the commentary that Johan provided can attest to. Uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time on the market. I think that this audience is, is very aware of that. Um, you know, we've done some work with Ernst & Young recently that pegs the plant-based food market at uh, $250 billion. We really believe that Canada can be a major supporter of that. And that's some of the things that we'd like to explore in this panel uh, today. You know, Canada's opportunity in plant-based foods, we think, is unprecedented. Uh, if the market is worth $250 billion, we truly believe that we as a, as a nation can uh, achieve 10% of that or, or $25 billion in annual sales of plant-based foods and ingredients. And we recently launched a sector roadmap that lays out the plan for Canada to try to achieve that. 
It's really based around three themes of innovation. I think innovation will underpin the growth of the sector long-term. We'll be talking about and consuming products that we haven't dreamed of today. And I think the previous speaker just illustrated the versatility of plant-based foods. It's very exciting. Uh, another area is, is scale. We're talking about how to grow an industry today to meet the global demand for plant-based foods. Uh, in Canada today, we're really thinking about how do we scale an industry of ingredient and plant-based food production? How do we think about foreign direct investment? How do we create connections with uh, companies and organizations like we're doing today to really grow the sector, not only for the benefit of Canada, but for the benefit of, uh, of the global plant-based food sector? And we, we really focused on Prosper, which is as pushing as far down the value chain as we can. We, we really want to work and, and monetize Canada's value proposition. And I think some of the things that we're gonna talk about today will, will lead us there. But implicit in that goal of $25 billion is strong international ties. It includes collaboration in innovation, collaboration in markets in market development and fostering conversations like this today. And so uh, those are the few of the topics that we're gonna cover today with Blair and Craig and Tristan and, and Benjamin. I'm really looking forward to that discussion and, uh, and, and we'll bring in the panel. Thank you, Bill. Now, just before we bring in the panel, a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A section below. So first, we have Blair Bullis, president of Top Tier Foods Incorporated. He decided to pursue his current career when he was in university. Blair was standing in the grocery store and noticed the high levels of sodium and lack of nutritional value in the products. Um, his new and exciting initiative is a Wagyu, Wagyu beef initiative. Our next panelist is Craig Goodwin, founder and president of Naturally Splendid Enterprises. He's overseen their transition from a private company to a public company, raising over $20 million in the process. He's also in charge of international business development. Currently, Craig is developing businesses in several locations, including South Korea, Japan, China, Germany, and Australia. Also joining the panel is Benjamin Kulisnik, Senior Manager for Trade and Negotiations in BC's Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation, where he re re represents BC's interest in trade negotiations. After 10 years of lobbying for small and medium-sized businesses, he took up his current position to try to make changes from within. Next is Tristan Choi. Tristan is the co-founder and CEO of Lupin Platform Incorporated, where he is a leading group was leading rather a group of capable teams to create a fully integrated lupin supply chain from the seed licensing, farming and cultivation, value added processing and protein extraction, plus new ingredient in food development in Canada. Please welcome our panelists. Bill, I'll hand it back to you. Great, thank you, Zara, and, and uh, welcome panelists, and thank you for taking time out of, out of your evening to join this, this really important uh, discussion. And we're going to build on, I think, some of the themes that we heard in the previous speakers and just explore some of the, some of the learnings that you've had as, uh, as, as business people and working in, in governments and, and supporting businesses. And Blair, maybe I'll start with you. I mean, you're innovating in, a, in this really exciting space. It, it's highly innovative and it's highly technical. Tell us a little bit about Top Tier and Wanamay Foods and, and how your products will be differentiated in the marketplace. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited about talking about this um, product that we're, we're working on right now, which is a complete Wagyu beef alternative. Uh, and we've decided to focus our attention uh, really narrowly which is a little bit different than what the market has been uh, doing recently, which is really broad in scope, focusing on development of uh, multiple platforms for plant-based products, working in um, yeah, meatballs and then moving on to, to strips and steaks. Uh, we really wanna focus our attention on developing a premium product, a premium beef product uh, that we can uh, research and develop in Canada, but then export the technology globally. Uh, for us, we started with Wagyu beef because Wagyu beef is really widely considered to be one of the world's best beefs. Uh, it has a higher fat content than most other beefs out there, uh, but it also allows us to uh, pick a target and, and try and develop something that uh, has a 
has a threshold for us, something that we can actually challenge ourselves to meet, meet the expectation of what the market is. Uh, and for us, when we uh, partnered uh, with our research teams in Canada, we went with companies that have uh, the experience uh, to, to really develop uh, a premium product. They've been working in this space for a very long time. So it's partnering with uh, the world's best researchers, partnering with uh, institutions like UBC to create uh, what is going to be a, a, a higher fat, higher, uh, a more clean label product uh, than what you'd see generally within the plant-based space. Uh, so our focus is really narrow, but what that allows us to do is really uh, engineer something that is better than, than the plant-based materials that are out there using Canadian raw materials. Uh, and then once we've able to kind of create the textures and the profile that creates that premium product, it'll open up a network of secondary processing uh, for us in, in the future. So really uh, making ourselves, define ourselves as that premium product on the market, whereas other companies are really trying to go broad. We're going very narrow uh, and it has allowed us to really partner with uh, downstream companies that are looking for something to elevate their brand. When a company like, uh, when a when a white tablecloth company is using a Beyond Meat, that's great. The demand is there for that, but so is a McDonald's and so is a Burger King. So for us, we want to elevate those, those companies, give them something that will bring their profile up just as much uh, as it does for, for anybody else. Uh, we can elevate that brand by creating a premium product. Uh, so that's really what we're trying to do uh, and yeah. focusing on that really high-end category. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Blair. We could probably spend the whole time just unpacking some of the things you talked about there, which is, you know, the business strategy of narrow versus diverse. You touched on Canada's innovation ecosystem, some of the things that we we're we're, we're interested in exploring. But I'm going to go now to Craig. You know, naturally splendid enterprises. You've been around a bit longer, maybe than Blair's organization. You've grown your brand's revenue many multiples. Tell us a little bit about your organization and how strong ties to Korea help grow your business. Absolutely. And then thank you very much, Bill. And thank you to uh, City Age and, and all the organizers uh, for today's event. Um, it is my, my pleasure and true honor to be here to uh, participate. Um, I am the CEO of Naturally Splendid and, and the co-founder of it. And we're a Vancouver-based company that specializes in plant-based products and ingredients. And in fact, we've been doing business in Korea since 2015. Um, but going back uh, over 10 years ago, our true mission was to bring plant-based nutrition to a mainstream market. Now, in today's environment, being plant-based is very much mainstream, of course. But 10 years ago, much like Johan stated, uh, we had to explain really what protein was and that there was an option to animal protein. And this really was the drive behind Naturally Splendid. We were a pioneer at the time, and we continue to be a pioneer. Um, and I did have the great pleasure to do business starting back uh, in Korea, starting back in, in 2015. Um, and so I was first introduced to the opportunities through some fantastic provincial um, government organizations, the BC Ministry of International Trade um, here in, in uh, British Columbia. We're so fortunate in Canada to have great support uh, municipally, um, provincially and federally. So for that, we're very thankful to help us grow our business. Um, but we, uh, back in 2016, were one of the first companies to begin exporting hemp uh, to Korea uh, from Canada. Um, and we actually still uh, export, not to be near the volumes that we used to, but the last container of, of hemp hearts, uh, which is a protein-packed uh, plant uh, growing uh, in Canada, of course. Um, our last uh, container left just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we're, um, we were focused at the time um, in, in, in 2015 um, to give you an idea of the opportunity in Korea and how explosive it truly is. 2015, there was an export of only $500,000 from country to country, from Canada to Korea and hemp. We began to get these signals, uh, the, the buying uh, signals from Korea that hemp had an opportunity there. And I'm really pleased to report that within one year, Canada exported almost $50 million of, of hemp uh, to Korea in just one year. So that's not a 10 times, it's a hundred times uh, a growth in one year. And this is the kind of explosive opportunity that exists when you're working with such a, a country as dynamic as Korea. 
Um, today, Naturally Splendid owns and operates a food manufacturing facility um, in the greater Vancouver area. Um, but we manufacture a range now. So instead of just being ingredient based with our plant based proteins, we're creating finished products. Uh, we began with plant based bars uh, with, with plant proteins as the feature ingredient, of course. But now we offer over 40 plant based entrees. Um, yes, we know the Beyond Meat and the burgers that are our most popular out there. But we believe consumers, whether they be vegans, vegetarians, or the largest, largest plant based consumer, which are the flexitarians, want a wide range of products. Now, our products are, are meant to be meat replacements. They want to have that mouthfeel, that taste, the look of traditional products. And we believe that is a great um, entry point into, um, uh, into Korea, to flexitarians, into that market space. Um, we found that working in Korea, the best combination was to find a strong Korea partner, whether that be in food distribution or manufacturing. Um, great Canadian grown products with strong Korean partnership was our secret to explosive growth. Um, there are many different ways to market in Korea, uh, and you really need local representation and local expertise to tap into those channels. For example, home shopping channels, uh, which are prevalent and very popular in Korea, may not be as popular in North America. But we, through our distributor, um, operated through a latte, and we did a series of TV commercials there where we were producing or we were selling over 40 thousand pounds, 20,000 kilograms per one hour show. And these are opportunities and channels that we simply didn't have any, any experience in. Um, I did have great pleasure in participating in, in one of the commercials. Uh, so I can tell you that it was dynamic. I like to say that uh, the opportunities in, uh, in Korea are comfortably aggressive. This is a, a, an environment that Naturally Splendid is comfortable in working in. But we found that once the opportunity was, uh, was visualized, the partnerships made, the, the length of time to market is very quick. And that's the comfortably aggressive, is that once the opportunity is identified, then it is all out to get product to market. And that is a very unique and special place to do business. And we very much look forward to uh, expanding our opportunity there again in 2021. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Craig. A lot of uh, a lot of um, business lessons for all of us in terms of bringing the best of what Canada has to bear together with on the ground knowledge and accessing markets in Korea seems to be a bit of a, a secret sauce. Um, Tristan, I'm I'm really interested in the story of Lupin Platform. Uh, you know, you're a vertically integrated approach. So tell us a bit about being. Uh, you know, you've got a, a different perspective. You're a Korean immigrant to Canada and the experience of building your business here, you've got even more insight than, than Craig would have, I think. The opportunity. First of all, it is an honor to be able to speak with this event. As you said, as a 1.5 generation Korean Canadian, I'm just very humble to be able to participate and share my knowledge and experience with you. So as we all know, there are growing interest in finding a plan uh, plant protein ingredient for food application. Uh, and Canada has abundant source of that. There's fava bean, chickpea, oats, and lentil. Uh, you can name it, just too many of them. Another ingredient that we are trying to uh, create here is a lupin. It's, uh, it's gaining a spotlight as a new superfood, as a sweet lupin. I don't know if you heard of that. So what I can probably proudly say that we are probably the most advanced company in Canada that holds the seed license, the cultivation know-how, protein extraction techniques to customize for different plant protein application. So in my hand, I have one variety. I have uh, two varieties that I can show. And in my hand here, it's a 92.8% uh, dry base protein isolate you created with lupin. So the idea of growing lupin in Canada actually first came from Korea, which is ionic. Uh, which is quite exciting too. The first pioneer who saw the opportunity to supply Lupin to Korea, that's how the whole business started. And since I joined the company, we have also expanded the business spectrum in the food ingredient and processing aspect of the business. And in order to be less dependent on the global market fluctuation, the idea was to propose to create a complete vertically integrated, a closed loop Lupin ecosystem which means that we control the seed supplies, 
a tight contract farming to maintain the best management farming practice, as well as environmentally friendly way of processing and create our own brand as a food development as well. So that's our business model. So we hold exclusive seed license for six looking varieties that are most suitable for Canadian growing climate, which took us some time to do so with a lots of R&D and investment. We also expanded closed loop cultivation from Alberta to Manitoba. Our focus was in the Prairie area, but we now expand it to Ontario, PEI, and next year we're starting our plot trials in the USA market as well. So, the implementing uh, also next year, we are going to implement MIT indoor seed film cultivation technique where there's a biodegradable uh, application and direct mulching technique that will limit the use of a chemical inoculant to produce organic lupin from 2023, which is quite excited about that. In terms of the food development, we are testing to make lupin milk. A lot of uh, pictures has uh, circulated here the milk, the yogurt, uh, dumpling, dough, and also since me being Asian, tofu. It's a quite key ingredient for lupin. And also those people who are not tolerant to gluten, uh, soy sauce has some limitations. So we want to create lupin soy sauce. I should have said lupin sauce to come up with alternative choice for that. Also in a higher profile, we also work with some companies to come up with isolate with the meat, fish, and egg functional application. Uh, some of the companies that we name, you're probably uh, aware of it. So these are the sort of journey we have taken in the last four or five years so far. The journey has been quite wonderful. So my experience as lastly, as a Korean Canadian uh, developing this uh, kind of opportunity, I can say from my experience, Canada has one of the best business nurturing environment in the world, especially when it comes to agriculture and food sectors. Uh, with the support from Canada, Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement, I hope to see increased collaboration and business will outcome from the discussion. So, hello, Korea. Canada is open for business. Let's talk. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Tristan. That was a great segue to, to Benjamin. You know, Benjamin, I think there was an underlying theme that I heard, and it was all about strength of a business strategy. And they're, they're different, but they're all strong. We had you know, focus on a narrow product stream versus diverse product stream. We've got vertical integration versus partnership. But what underlies that, all of that, is the need for a highly competitive business environment. And, you know, Tristan just, just hit on that. So tell us a bit about the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement, what that can do for uh, Canadians doing business in Korea, because a strong business environment, I, you know, I believe is, is underpinned and includes strong trade agreements. So talk a little bit about the Canada-Korea free trade agreements and, and how that helps support businesses like we've just heard. Sure, thank you, Bill and Zara and the CKBA and uh, City Age. Hi, everyone, uh, Before I do that, Bill, I'm just gonna put in a, a quick plug for, for some of the work that uh, I do as a BC trade yeah. rep. Uh, BC's trade policy and negotiations branch represents BC's interests in those, those uh, international and domestic free trade agreement negotiations, uh, as well as any disputes that uh, affect BC. Uh, and we also do free trade agreement promotion. And South Korea is uh, indeed a priority market for BC. They are regularly in our top five goods export markets. And this uh, increasingly includes some of the products that, that have been discussed today. Um, I think the importance of Korea to BC is really underscored by the existence of BC trade and investment representatives that are located in Seoul. Uh, our, our reps have been able to facilitate some deals in the plant-based food and beverage space. And so if you are a BC uh, business on the line today looking to do business in Korea, I strongly encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, and the same goes if you're in Korea looking to, to do business in BC. Now, before I get to, to uh, the CKFTA, I just wanted to quickly go over some of the challenges that, uh, that, that we've heard. Um, one of the other advantages of having trade reps on the ground is that they can provide uh, some, of that, some of that intel that comes from, from what's happening. And um, one of the challenges that, that we're aware that has relevance for, I think for some of you on the call today, is Korea's regulations around labeling and packaging. 
And in Korea, KFDA regulations prohibit a lot of claims around some of the health benefits or uh, sort of broadcasting the absence of certain ingredients on the packaging. So it's often not okay to have packaging that say things like uh, dairy-free or no artificial uh, flavors or colors or preservatives and so on. And uh, the other thing is that Canada and Korea don't yet have an organic equivalency agreement. And so the, or the word organic cannot be used either. Um, many of these things, I think, you know, we're, we're used to seeing regularly on packaging within Canada, and it just isn't permitted. So uh, if there are a lot of claims on your packaging and you're sort of, you know, you're still looking to, to export, you're not, you know, at export ready or you're, you're looking to Korea as a possibility, um, it's something you might want to consider. Um, as of now, a lot of those claims might need to be covered up with stickers and so on. Um, and so you may, you may even want to consider some alternative packaging. Uh, these, these kinds of issues, uh, of course, may have legitimate objectives, uh, but when they don't, these are the kinds of things that uh, myself and, um, of course, my federal trade colleagues can, can seek to address. Uh, they can be raised at free trade agreement or forums or at the WTO. Uh, and if you are encountering issues like this when you're, you know, when you're looking to do business in Korea, please uh, reach out to myself or a BC trade rep or a trade commissioner. Now, here's the good news. The CKFTA is uh, absolutely full of a lot of provisions that can make doing business in Korea a lot easier. Uh, it can make your goods more competitive. Uh, and of course, it also applies uh, when doing business into Canada. It uh, makes things a lot more predictable and uh, transparent. It establishes a stab uh, set rules that uh, everyone is aware of and they're backed up by dispute settlement. Uh, before the agreement came into place, uh, you probably know that Canadian companies were really at a disadvantage because uh, their, their American and their EU competitors already had preferential access in Korea. So this, this deal was, you know, it's, it's as, as the Consul General mentioned this, uh, earlier, uh, this deal is now more than five years old. Uh, it really put us on a level playing field with those, those competitors, but also gives us a leg up on those that uh, don't yet have that preferential access with Korea. Now, the, the first and most obvious thing that it does is it reduces and eliminates tariffs. And uh, that was mentioned as well. 98.5% uh, of, of Canada's uh, exports are now eligible for duty-free access into Korea. And by 2029, 99% of Canadian exports in the agriculture and agri-food sector will be eligible for duty-free treatment. And this is, this is really significant because uh, Korea, and, and as you probably know, a lot of other countries maintain quite high tariffs on many agricultural goods. Uh, the, there are many examples, there are lots of products I, I think are probably represented by the attendees on, on the call today, but things like plant-based meat, textured protein substances, uh, protein concentrates, these kinds of things are duty-free as of this year, uh, but they face a rate of 8% uh, for all other uh, competitors that, are, that don't have that free trade agreement access or some other uh, FTA access. Uh, a great resource that I, would, that I would draw everyone's attention to is Canada's Tariff Finder. This is uh, an online tool where you can very easily uh, find out the tariff that your product will face in a market where Canada has an FTA. Uh, you, all you need to get started is uh, the market that you're interested in, as well as the Harmonized Systems Code, the HS code, uh, or just a keyword for your product. And it's developed by the government of Canada. It's very easy to use. Once you punch in that information, it will uh, give you the tariff that uh, that product will face, as well as any phase outs that might be in, in effect for the relevant FTA. And that includes Korea, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, um, to take advantage of that tariff, you need to, to also, of course, prove that your good meets the rules of origin. Now, if your product is, is wholly obtained within Canada, that's, that's probably not going to be an issue. Um, the CKFTA's rules of origin are, are really similar to Canada's uh, other FTAs, but they can be very complicated. And so uh, it, it, that becomes even more complicated if your product contains inputs from outside of Canada or outside of Korea. So if that's something that uh, you're curious about, uh, please uh, do get in touch with myself or uh, a trade commissioner. Um, 
let's just say though that you have that preferential tariff rate and you think your goods meet the rules of origin, it's important to note that you're also not going to get that preferential treatment automatically. Uh, the importer or the exporter, uh, sorry, the producer or the exporter must claim that uh, preferential rate and they have to do that using a certificate of origin. And these can vary by agreement, but they're usually quite simple. They're just sort of form, form letters that you need to populate the information with. Uh, and after all of that, if there is still any question about uh, your goods, uh, whether or not they're going to receive that treatment, uh, you can apply for an advanced ruling. And this is probably one of the single biggest, uh, most effective uh, trade facilitation tools that Canada's FTAs have. The CPFTA also has a provision for them. Uh, they, they basically expedite customs clearance and provide you certainty that your product is going to be classified as, as, as what you think it is uh, when it reaches the border so that there are no surprises. Uh, and the last thing I would mention very quickly, Bill, is, is uh, that the CKFTA also addresses non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. We saw the poll question earlier. I think it was ranked as number three in terms of potential barrier. Uh, you know, technical requirements, differing standards, whatever it might be. Uh, if you're being told that you need to have your product tested or go through the same testing on both ends, that's, that's obviously very frustrating and uh, undermines the gains from some of those tariff reductions. So the, the good thing is that the agreement promotes the use of inter, uh, international standards. Uh, it improves your access to things like laws and regulations. Uh, it, it has a specific committee that is you know, designed uh, based on science and risk-based uh, assessments uh, and really promotes co cooperation across uh, the two trade partners to address some of these barriers. Yeah, oh, great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Benjamin. There's always so much to consider when we're um, talking about export markets and, uh, and the, growth of, uh, the growth of businesses in Canada. You know, I, I think one of the things I think about, one of the things I've seen working in Protein Industries Canada for the last while is uh, one of the strengths that Canada brings as a small country is this idea of a tightly knit value chain. We've got, um, you know, plant breeders, we've got production agriculture, we've got ingredient manufacturers and, and, and food producers, all re working relatively close together. Blair or Craig or Tristan, do you want to comment on the benefits of um, working in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem in Canada where you've got access to all the different points of the value chain and how that helps you maybe either iterate products to innovate products or to meet consumer uh, demand with what it is that you're doing? Anybody want to take that? Why don't I jump in there quickly because I'm at the end of the value chain. I'm at the I, I have finished product. And so for us, we really need to have that whole ecosystem in place for us to be able to innovate all the way from the ground to the end consumer. Uh, and so for us, we work with people that are on this call. We work with Burkon and Merrick uh, on our ingredient supply side. And we're working mm -hmm. through some of the innovation hubs like the Saskatchewan Food Development Center through UBC uh, in terms of do, the, doing the research and development uh, and then through manufacturers uh, and, and dis distribution in Canada. So yeah, having that ecosystem and being able to, to access it is really important. But because of Protein Industries Canada, who built up uh, this ecosystem, uh, we are able to access that. So that's a real big benefit to, to Canadians. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Blair. Craig or Tristan? Yeah, you know what? I was going to, to reaffirm the same thing. Um, we, you know, what our starting business was, was focused around hemp. We worked very closely uh, with farmers and understood uh, what their needs were and, and how to grow the business. Um, but as we began to become more experienced in Canada and, and, and um, gain more experience, um, we found that that value chain, in fact, really needed to be tapped into. So Canada is so specially positioned for this opportunity, for this plant-based opportunity, for the wonderful growing agricultural that we have, um, the innovation that's being built um, and, and discovered every day by companies like Burkhan. Um, innovative food um, development companies and, and, and producers like myself that are looking to meet the consumer demand. And I just think that we're so, so fortunately positioned for that. And then on top of it, to have the wonderful government support that we, that we do have. So that ecosystem where we have right from seed, right to sale, maybe an mm -hmm. overused term, truly is something that we have an advantage of. And we need to embrace that here in Canada. And it's been very beneficial for naturally spending in our existence. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Craig. Tristan, do you have thoughts on that? I have to mimic what Blair and Craig just said. We, our company actually started with simple cultivation to supply feed market in Korea. 
So that's how the looping story began. It was a very simple process, but more and more literatures that we studied, there's more functionality we can discover. And we just took a leap of faith and we went ahead but with the resources that Canada provides with the food development center, with the research centers and all the government grants that's available. So one of the reasons I say Canada has one of the best environment to nurture business, especially in the agriculture, is because of all this support system that mm -hmm. helps small entrepreneurs to really take this faith and just go at it, right? So in the process, we're not only able to grow, but in the process of cultivation, the process of uh, ext uh, protein extraction, there are so many different uh, findings that was not available uh, in looping literature. So that's mm -hmm. also becoming to uh, helping us to develop more intellectual property or trade secrets for the company. And that actually can be uh, spin up in different functional uses as well. So going that, having that ecosystem support of Canada, it's key. So anybody wants to venture out, I go for it. It's there, they'll support you. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank, I, I haven't been paying attention to the clock, so somebody's going to have to give me a hook here, but I'm, I'm intensely curious with these, uh, with, these, with these entrepreneurs on, so I'm just going to keep asking questions till I get told to stop. Um, you know, one of the things that I find when I talk to consumer packaged goods companies is they're really focused, laser focused in on the environmental footprint of the ingredients that, uh, that, that they're using in their food products, trying to think about the carbon life cycle analysis of the food products that they have. Anybody want to make comment on, you know, it's kind of building on this idea of the value chain, where Canada can be positioned and, and how we fare relative to some of those uh, ideas around environmental sustainability of our ingredients. I, I, I see I've only got three minutes left. So uh, Craig, Blair and Tristan, why don't you give your thoughts on Canada as an as a environmentally sustainable place for food production? You know what, I'll take a, a quick 30 second shot and, and, and just bring back to the origin of Naturally Splendid um, and the incredible um, uh, progress we've made in hemp cultivation in Canada. Uh, it's an incredible protein source, but the sustainability, the carbon um, sequestering of this particular plant really is second to none. And with companies out there that are in development such as Burkhan, and I've heard hemp come up several times, this is a combination of, of a plant-based environment that Canada has, and with our rich history in growing hemp uh, mm -hmm. since 1998, we really have an opportunity to not only provide nutrition, but also environmental solutions. And, and the crops that we're growing are really adding benefit and solving problems out there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Blair. Yeah, so just from a finished products perspective, uh, Obviously, because we're able to actually take a lot of industrial meat production off the market, uh, anything that we're able to do within uh, a finished product, that really helps that the, the environmental aspect. So for us, obviously, we're not on the ingredient side, but we're focused on developing those products that will remove some of the animal uh, agricultural uh, infrastructure out uh, and, and replace it with a plant-based alternative, which uh, has a proven environmental uh, impact over time. So for us, it's, it's really focusing uh, on developing that product that pulls mm -hmm. people from uh, a meat-based uh, uh, concept to uh, a plant-based concept. So really it's, uh, if we can focus and get that product right, we'll, we'll move a lot of people uh, into a more uh, sustainable diet. Yeah, Tristan, last word on environmental sustainability in Canada. Absolutely. There's a reason why Canada ranks one of the top in the world when it comes to agriculture, because Canada not only just focuses on the pure economic size of it, but also social and environmental responsibility that comes with it. And all the farmers that I've met, all the processors that I've spoken with, they're so, they're very, their integrity level to preserve the environment and follow the practice that's in place, uh, that's second to none in the world. That's why everyone needs to consider Canada as their market access. Yeah, I'll just stop there. Do the time. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it, Tristan. Uh, everyone needs to consider Canada. So that's right. Benjamin, Blair, Craig, and Tristan, thank you so much. Pleasure, thank Very you. Much. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our expert panel. Um, that was an engaging and interesting conversation. If you want to know more about our panelists, check the chat box for links to our uh, panelists information. And now please help me to welcome our final guest, Mr. Jay Lee, manager in the strategy management group for Daesung Corporation.
He manages overseas sales, business development, and handles new product launches. He's here today to talk to us about Daesung and the business opportunity that they see in Canada. Mr. Jay Lee, please take it away. Nice. Uh, good evening there. So, so far, good morning here. Right. Um, first of all, it's my pleasure to have this great opportunity to introduce our. Oh, sorry. Uh, I better put my screen on the. Um... Right. Do you have slides for us, Jay? Perfect. Everyone can see this. All right. Okay. Um, sorry. First of all, it's my pleasure to have this great opportunity to introduce our company and. Daesung and its business. I'll share our business strategy's direction today and vision. Uh, and I hope we could optimize this opportunity to develop a the cooperative relationship with a valuable and uh, potential partner here. First, I would like to introduce two major and core businesses of Daesung. Mm, in great business, we uh, De Daesung has been grown up as a, a bio-fermentation company with global competitiveness. We opened our first chapter of biotechnology for the first time in Korea in uh, 1962, quite a long time ago. Later, we developed it, many of amino acids and alga-based ingredients. As you know, uh, some of the other based ingredients can be used as a um, great uh, raw material for, you know, um, plant-based uh, protein, for example, chlorella. Moreover, Desa is evolving as the biggest cost uh, domestic starch and sweetener manufacturer in Korea. Uh, food business, Desa is aiming to grow beyond Korea and become a general food company, expanding its uh, business area to global. And trying to create a healthy and um, food, food, food culture with Chung Jung Won brand. Um, not sure one of them, one of us, uh, one of you uh, will already hear about this brand. This is quite uh, popular in Korea, actually. In 1999, Daesung made Big hit with uh, Daesung Chlorella by entering the health business area and strength the cold storage business by taking over Jonga in 2006. Uh, actually, Jonga is a brand for uh, kimchi, uh, Korean traditional food. Uh, and we are the, we, we have the uh, number one brand of uh, kimchi in Korea. Uh, we also have tofu. Uh, and uh, is you know um, uh, tofu tofu is one of the uh, cold chain product, so uh, we are now expanding our business from domestic market Korea and the abroad. Uh, let's look at the final shelf summary overview. We achieved over three thousand five hundred bill billion one sales last year, and it's about three billion in U.S. dollar. As you can see, the sales portion between ingredient business and food business is about 30% and 70%. And the portion of global business is growing and it takes about 30% out of total sales. Uh, global networks, based on headquarters in Korea, Daesung is expanding its business territory. As we are basically manufacturer, I would like to let you know that we have manufacturing facilities in different areas. For example, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and China, of course, in Korea. Um, actually, I belong to an ingredient business unit. So uh, today I would like to explain a little bit about uh, ingredient business of Daesung. Based on corn process, we run starch and sweetener business. As a bio-based ingredient, we mainly use fermentation technology and brand amino acids, uh, flavor enhancers, and microalgae businesses. In terms of the uh, alternative food and the plant-based food, our amino acids and the different types of flavor enhancers and microalgae, of course, can be used as an ingredient for this plant-based food. 
Besides our own product-based business, we are open to cooperate with partners for CMO models. Uh, I'll skip this history slide, sorry. As you can see, uh, we play in different types of industries such as food and feed, personal care, cosmetics and nutrition and pharmaceutical at present. Taking this chance, I would like to share our strictest direction. According to new trends from different industries, we believe we could do something and set our strategic directions as chart here. And definitely alternative protein is one of our future strategic direction and we'll keep searching our role and finding right partners in this field. People need protein and uh, we are, we've been taking protein from plant and animal such as soy, you know, beans, hemp seed, cow, pig, chicken, fish, salmon, etc. However, we all know it is time to search alternative protein and Daysan wants to pr provide uh, bio-based proteins in the market. And if you could find uh, right partners for a corporation for alt protein, it'll be more than great chance, I believe. Um, there are many types of, many different types of proteins we are, uh, we are using and we can, approve, we can achieve, uh, we have access. I would like to speak a little bit about bio-based. We, uh, we have fermentation technologies. Uh, we have long uh, experience and very experienced and skilled people here. And uh, we, can, we can produce some cult cultured meat maybe, and uh, add albumin and algal proteins and microprotein. These kind of proteins can be produced based on fermentation fermentation technologies. And we are already uh, producing actively microalgae protein, chlorella, and uh, we are trying to uh, produce microprotein now. And uh, we made some investment on uh, some startup company who is, uh, who is trying to uh, produce cultured meat in the future. I took uh, this, this is mind map called a vision presentation of the landscape of fermentation within alternative proteins and it's from GFI. I brought this map because this is a great map, I think, that I can speak about which field and partners we are looking for and what we can do for them. In terms of approaches, approaches, we are happy to talk to someone from precision fermentation companies or a different type of a biomass tech company. Now we are a uh, one of the leading manufacturer of a microalgae gorilla, but we are still interested in different type of organisms such as uh, fungal, mycelium, etc. Moreover, we we'll think it would be great if we can take chance to cooperate the P2C business companies who have consumer products already. So um, finally, uh, we they some ways to cooperate great partners and uh, open to talk in this alternative food industry, and not only protein. Uh, so uh, if someone is interested in cooperation with they some, for a Korea, a business in Korea or businesses in abroad in Canada, uh, we are happy to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee. And thank you to all of our guests today. On behalf of CKBA's president, Sung Woo Van, and CKBA board members, we would like to thank you for attending the City H digital event. CKBA would also like to acknowledge Global Affairs Canada and the Korean Consulate General of Vancouver for their financial support. As you may know, CKBA is a nonprofit volunteer organization. Its mandate is to support and enhance trade investments, joint ventures, and R&D opportunities between Canada and Korea by working closely with public and private organizations. 
Many of you have opted to participate in the all important post event one to one meetings. CKBA will be reaching out to you to help facilitate these introductions. Please contact them if you can assist, if they can assist your business in any way. Finally, if you are not a member of CKBA, please consider joining today as the free membership is going to be running out at the end of this year. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Zara Alani, and it was my pleasure to be your anchor. If you have an idea for a City Age episode or want to take part as a partner, please reach out to us. Also, check back on our site, cityage.com, for information on all of our speakers and for future events. Today's episode, Opportunities Beyond Borders, will be on the site in about a week. Thank you once again. Until next time.